Hi, I'm Noah Charles. I'm the scholar in residence in physics at Reed College, and this is the first video in a course that I'm putting together on thermal physics. The course is principally aimed at undergraduates learning thermal physics for the first time, but I hope that it can present some aspects of thermal physics in a way that hasn't been done before, even for more experienced observers. I want to start this course off by thinking about what thermal physics is, in particular, what kind of theory it is. I would say that the majority of theories that people may have encountered in physics before at the undergraduate level are what I would call theory-first approaches. And what I mean by theory-first is that a set of equations, a model, is given, and then we look for example systems in the real world that the model may fit well. I think classical physics falls into this category. E&M and even quantum mechanics. For instance, in classical physics, you may learn Newton's laws and then use them to think about orbital mechanics. You may look at E&M and, and realize that those uh, equations, that Maxwell's equations, apply very well to conductivity in metals. But in any case, the equations are very well situated, and then we go looking for sort of nails to hit with our hammer. I think thermal physics is a different type of field of study. I would call it phenomena first. We have some sense of what thermal phenomena are. Then we go looking for models to explain those phenomena. So we have some sense that some things are hot, others are cold, that there are some kind of dynamics that go on between those kinds of objects, and we start to look for ways to explain those dynamics. So, okay, fair enough. Maybe there are these two kinds of theories, and maybe thermal falls into this second category. But if it's a phenomena first theory, then we should spend some time thinking about those phenomena. Let's check off this first item and start working on what intuitions we have about thermal phenomena. I'm gonna say that we principally have two types. The first is the kind that anyone would have simply from existing in the world and experiencing things. The second is the kind that we have because we've studied some physics before and we have some idea of what thermal phenomena might be. Okay, so let's think about those first. Let's call them perhaps pre-modern intuitions. And those begin really with thermoperception. Thermal perception is really just, uh, in specific, the fact that we can feel hot and cold. But I want to use it in a slightly more general sense. It's our experience of phenomena that have to do with heat, hotness, cold, and coldness in the world. So, for instance, we notice that some objects feel hot and others feel cold. But more than that, we realize that when we bring a hot object into contact with a cold object, the hot object gets colder and the cold object gets hotter. We notice that fire seems to make things hot and heat can cause fires. We notice that when we're in the sun's light, that that seems to make us hot and that day is hotter than night. We realize that sometimes heat can seem to, seem, seems to be able to cause substantive changes in objects, like when water turns into steam. And perhaps those of us who go on uh, sort of hikes on mountains or perhaps who close things into sealed containers realize that there's some sort of relationship between heat and pressure that's interesting but a little harder to elucidate. So those kinds of thermoperceptive instincts lead us to sort of start to speculate about what heat might be. And really, when we think about what type of uh, uh, thing heat might be, we have, I think, three exhaustive options. So heat could be some sort of object in itself. We might also say a substance.
So, okay, heat is an object or a substance. It's something that we can't see directly, but maybe that's there in some invisible sense, affecting things, and that's what we're feeling when we touch something hot. Another possibility that's been popular throughout history is maybe heat is a property of objects. It's something which inheres in objects themselves uh, rather than being an object. So maybe it's an adjective. It's sort of like an apple has redness in the same way that a fire has heat. A last possibility is that heat is some sort of action concept. So before, we've already mentioned that heat seems to so somehow characterize the fact that when we put a hot thing into contact with a cold thing, the hot thing becomes colder and the cold thing becomes hotter. It's somewhat like pouring water from one container into another. There seems to be something moving between the two. And that gives us this sort of verbiness that might characterize heat, might make it an action concept. Now, all three of these have had proponents throughout the years. For instance, the object uh, theory was really at the, at the uh, heart of the theory of caloric that became en vogue in the first half of the 19th century. Whereas the heat as a property of objects, I think is what's intuitive to a lot of people. It turns out that the heat as action sort of concept is really more at the heart of modern theories of thermodynamics. But I do really want you to interrogate what your own intuitions are about this. Next, I wanna move into our sort of maybe more modern intuitions. And by that, I mean the fact that we've learned some physics, we all have access to the internet, maybe we watch documentaries. There are some ways that we come to know some facts about what people think, or at least think that we know. So I want us to check these kinds of intuitions uh, at the door, or at least check on them at the door. Because we may have some things right and some things wrong, but let's at least figure out what we think. I think the two most important things are atomic theory and kinetic theory. So atomic theory is the idea that there are some tiny particles that constitute some or all of what the world is. Those particles are smaller in scale or somehow smaller in level than what we interact with on the day-to-day. -day. Um, it turned out, of course, that this was basically led to the theory of actual atoms, but these particles didn't necessarily have to be atoms at the onset. It's only important that they're smaller than the kinds of things that we work with in a lab. Kinetic theory, on the other hand, is that the, the movement of these tiny particles is what leads to thermal phenomena. Both of these are things that you might have heard about in high school physics. You might also have heard that atomic theory leads to notions of entropy or, or something like that. And I want you to make sure that you're, you're clear with yourself that that's something that needs to be proven or at least needs to have a real model attached to it throughout the course. So make sure that you're careful when you think about those assumptions. Okay, so with all of that having been said and out of the way, Let's go to a breakdown of what we're going to do in this course. Now, this breakdown gets at the way that I think it's intuitive to think about the phenomena first model uh, or approach that we have to thermal physics. Because we're thinking in a phenomena first way, we need to construct a series of models which overlap, but aren't necessarily strictly coherent with each other, that explain the phenomena that we're interested in. Whatever we think of as being thermal phenomena, we need to come up with overlapping theories to describe. The first of those theories is thermodynamics, classical thermodynamics. Classical thermodynamics is a theory uh, for which the constituent objects are these isolated systems. These systems are somehow atomic themselves. They don't look like atoms in the sense that they're not tiny. They look maybe like boxes of gas, but they are atomic in the sense that they have parameters that describe them as a whole, but don't describe their internal structure. So a simple system, for instance, has a parameter like volume or like temperature but it doesn't have a parameter like 
temperature at point A and a, a different one like temperature at point B. It only has parameters that characterize it in its totality. And the theory effectively describes what happens when we, the user, interact with these systems in order to bring them together and allow them to exchange some quantities. Okay, next, this theory gives us a lot of mileage. We can use it to explain things like heat transfer between objects. We can use it to explain phase transitions. We can use it to explain even more complicated things like engines. We can't, however, use it to explain the wind. And the reason for that is that the wind relies on the fact that pressure and temperature at one point on Earth's surface are different than pressure and temperature at a different point on Earth's surface. In order to deal with those kinds of situations in which we have these non-homogeneous uh, parameters describing things maybe at different spatial points, we need what I'm calling the theory of thermal flow. And thermal flow is what happens when we take a larger system, maybe like the Earth's atmosphere, and we break it into small boxes or cubes. Each of those cubes functions like a simple system from classical thermodynamics, but now we use calculus and limits, basically, in order to turn it into a, a theory of dynamics, one that can describe things like when it will be windy, or what will happen when we let a kite go on, on a windy day, or a boat go in the ocean. Lastly, a really interesting, uh, or I should say a point of interest in the latter half of the 19th century was trying to explain classical thermodynamics using other theories that were thought to be more fundamental in physics. In the 1870s, this would have been classical mechanics, but by the 1920s, quantum mechanics and elements of quantum theory had migrated into this uh, type of description as well. Now, broadly, all of these things together constituted statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics tries to explain how theories of dynamics with deterministic dynamics like we find in classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, along with some notion of probability, which we'll discuss later, can lead to the kinds of thermal phenomena that we see in classical thermodynamics and in thermal flow. Now we'll investigate whether or not that sort of connection is as easy as some have made it out to be later on in the course. But statistical mechanics is at the forefront of lots of modern physics research and is something I'm really excited to get to cover in this course. The last thing I want to talk about before we leave here is entropy. This is not so much of a section as it is just a disclaimer. Entropy is something about which we have all gotten at least some received notion from out there in the, in the world. And I think that often those notions of entropy have it be something like disorder, randomness, or perhaps even a force that propels things in one direction in the universe. And what I want to be specific about as we go into this course is that we're going to have to be really careful with the concept of entropy. In particular, there are actually multiple different types of entropy that work in different ways, and some of which obey different principles than you may be familiar with. So this is definitely a place where I want you to use that intuition, but also check it. And with that, I'll say thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.